Why is health care reform among the top priorities of the Chinese government? The answer is obvious, because the Chinese people demand quality health care at reasonable prices, without large disparities among classes, and without endemic corruption in the system. How to achieve this ideal is not so obvious. The latest round of health care reform began in 2009, but it has encountered obstacles and pushbacks. One of the more significant new policies is the introduction of non-governmental health care institutions, especially private hospitals. How does private health care work in China? Does competition improve health care? What are the differences between public and private hospitals? How do patients benefit? What do doctors think? In any way, what's appropriate in a socialist system? Tracking health care in China keeps us closer to China. This is Yoshi County, the most populous county in Sanmin City, Fujian province. Though it provides health care services for over 450,000 residents, Yoshi County Hospital, the largest in the county, has only 500 beds. On any given day, makeshift beds take up half the corridor in the surgical department. Even with air conditioning, temperatures in the summer hardly get below 36 degrees Celsius or 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Hu Yongqing is a surgeon at the hospital. On a normal day, Hu conducts three-hour-long operations and has to finish his routine visits in between. The patient is suffering from skull fracture here, so some air has leaked into the skull. The number of patients regularly peaks during the summer. So the management at hospital has asked doctors to pull off all vacation requests and to work over time. Despite their hard work, being a doctor does not always pay well. This is my pay slip from 2012. That was before the salary reform. That month, my total income was 4,800 yuan. The 2012 average monthly salary in Fujian province was 3,700. That means whose salary is only just above the national average. Just like civil servants, medical workers in China are recruited as staff of government-affiliated institutions. Their payroll follows a salary system similar to that of civil servants. That means their payments are based more on rank rather than how well they perform. To increase doctors' incomes, a number of measures were brought in by doctors themselves, including illegal ones such as taking bribes or the overprescription of unnecessary medicines. There are about 2.8 million doctors and doctor's assistants in China. Like Hu Yongqing, many of them struggle with the tension between their moral obligation to save lives and their real-life responsibilities to earn a living and support their families. Foreigners may find this dichotomy hard to appreciate, as in many countries, doctors earn respectable salaries. To investigate China's health care problems and the latest reform policies, we interviewed two doctors. Liu Wei is an anesthesiologist at United Family Health. In 2015, she quit her job at a public hospital and joined a private hospital. Liu Xiaocheng is the president of Taida International Cardiovascular Hospital. He founded a public hospital in Tianjin, but with a management system similar to that of private healthcare institutions. Can going private offer at least a partial solution to China's uphill battle to reform healthcare? The uh, social status of doctors in the U.S. is very high, whereas in China, it, it doesn't seem to be as high as other kinds of professions, maybe in government, government officials. Whereas in the U.S., doctors would have a much higher public appreciation than government officials. Uh, and this is reflected in compensation. The compensation of doctors in the U.S., even if they're in medical centers or in uh, uh, private hospitals, this matter is very high compared to uh, other professions and hugely different than here in China. Do you perceive that to be accurate description? I see tremendous differences as a result of different social backgrounds. In China, doctor-patient relations over recent years have witnessed a bit tension. But I think it is not only a problem for doctors, but also a responsibility of the general social environment. In America, I've been to teaching hospitals and government-affiliated hospitals, all top-class medical institutions whose patients are most heavily ill and get transferred from family doctors 
or even lower leveled hospitals. In those places, you rarely see huge crowds. The riotous scene so typical of Chinese hospitals is simply never known to Americans. What are the root causes of that? Is it just uh, a population, large populations and lack of services? Just that at the moment, when we compare the medical system in China and that in America, it is easy to notice that China's system has to cater to the needs of a large population. So the government has to make a lot of investment, which is not only money-consuming, but also time and energy-consuming. So although China has its basic medical insurance, which keeps improving over the recent years, in comparison to the US, there is an enormous shortage of professional personnel in the primary and secondary medical institutions at the grassroots levels. Most doctors prefer larger hospitals at higher level. Why is it the case? On the one hand, in higher level institutions, doctors can get better or more opportunities. On the other, the gap in income also has a role to play. Well-trained doctors in higher level hospitals naturally feel reluctant to go to primary medical institutions. With smiling nurses waiting for questions and doctors always ready for a consultation, unfortunately a private hospital offers a sense of security that few Chinese patients have experienced. But all these come at a price. A normal caesarean section in the hospital where Dr. Liu Wei works would cost about 76,000 yuan, whereas in the public hospital the cost is only about 8,000. That's one-tenth of the cost for the same operation in a private hospital. And that is before the government-sponsored health insurance reimbursement. Despite the huge price difference, a lot of China's new rich are more than happy to go to private hospitals. As a working mom, I feel very exhausted in public hospitals where it is very crowded and doctors have too many patients. Here I can easily make appointments, the kids can enjoy better care, and the doctors can focus on us. Though it's much more expensive, I'm willing to pay for it. Why would a patient go to a private hospital? What are the benefits or advantages of going to a private hospital rather than a first-rate public hospital? Let me put it this way. If I were a patient, I'd prefer to have my complicated diseases treated by public hospitals because they present the most avant-garde medical level. However, if I only have a high blood pressure or coronary heart disease, I do not have to worry about wrong diagnosis. All I need is the management of the chronic disease. So for treatment of such common diseases, people mostly turn to private hospitals. Why? Because they boast a nicer and quiet environment. For an appointment at 10 o'clock, I will have my doctor waiting for me at 10 sharp. I don't need to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and line up in a long queue for registration or pay the scalpers a heavy price for a number. All I need is a phone call. The doctor would be waiting for me. He could recognize me and remember that I came to see him last week or last month. He knows everything about me. If I need to undergo a small operation, he can get everything ready for me right away. And then the patient's rooms are single rooms. There will be working staff receiving me and guiding me to the place. I wouldn't stand in the hall at a total loss of where to go. There were about 5,400 private hospitals on China's mainland in 2008, rising to over 13,000 by mid-2015. That accounts for nearly half of the total hospitals in China. Outpatient numbers also increased from 10 percent in 2013 to about 22 percent in 2016. Hao Deming, the vice president of the China Non-Government Medical Institutions Association, says the trend is likely to continue. Actually, so far, China is quite open in terms of its policies for hospitals funded by private capital. I think we can even excel over the Americans in terms of our openness. Foreign capital is allowed in seven coastal regions. Why? Why is there strong support? Over the past 60 years since the founding of the new China, our economic foundation is weak, people's health conditions are poor. So the government takes all the responsibilities to ensure treatment of people's diseases. The country manages it all. Even the medical staff are managed as national cadres to guarantee people have access to medical services. The major purpose of medication back then was to cure diseases. But after 60 years of development, especially the last 30 years since the reform and opening up, people have higher demands for their livelihoods, for their health. So the model is changing, mainly in two regards. 
First, we need to reform the healthcare system and change our concepts upon healthcare. Medical reform should gradually help us get rid of the national monopoly and foster an environment where public and non-public capital together fund hospitals for mutual prosperity. Second, our concepts of health care should shift from the traditional understanding of health care for curing diseases to a new relationship as health care for sound health. Only with reformed concepts can we get our medical services into a positive cycle. What were the issues or problems that, uh, and process that led to the opening up and the development of a non-public health care sector? As a matter of fact, non-public medical institutions have gone through 20 years of development. 20 years ago, the non-public medical industry experienced very tough years as there was little support from the government that encouraged non-public health care. The general public also didn't understand how non-public medical institutions can provide excellent multi-dimensional and multi-level medical services. Now that 20 years have gone by, the government has also become more aware of the importance of non-public hospitals. Currently, the government still takes public hospitals as the dominating force, while the non-public supplements it. But I believe that with the current trend, the non-public sector will also emerge powerful. Why? We and management know that with a population of 1.4 billion, each having different demands for medical services, the government simply cannot take it all on by itself. Describe the current conditions of the uh, non-governmental medical institutions in China, a little bit of the background, a little bit of the purpose, and where we are today, current conditions. Up to now, non-public medical institutions already amount to 220,000 in number. But the figure varies to a certain extent, according to which statistics you use. Out of the 220,000, 15,000 are clinics at the grassroots level, 14,000 or so are hospitals with beds. We classify hospitals without beds as clinics. So there are these two parts in a public medical system. One is clinics the other hospitals. So the non-public hospitals have outnumbered public ones in total. This is our data. But nationwide, the service amount provided by private hospitals only accounts for 15 percent of the total, while the public accounts for 85 percent. So the non-public is still vulnerable. But last March, the State Council issued a paper which requires that medical services provided by non-public institutions should try to hit 30 percent of the total within five years from 2015 to 2020. So currently, we are 15 percent behind our target. Some would say that as China builds its non-public health care sector, it is losing some of China's socialist characteristics because socialized medicine means that the government takes care of everything. Uh, is there a concern that as the public uh, sector in healthcare decreases and as the non-public sector increases, the private capital increases, that this reflects the overall structure of China as a socialist country? Do, do anybody concerned about that? Uh, well, this is a sensitive topic. Socialist countries also need a market economy. China has clearly defined itself as socialist with Chinese characteristics. Our characteristics include sectors of the market economy. In medical services, similar things also exist. If the country were to take responsibility for everyone's health care, it would be violating rules of the market economy, going against the development pattern of society and challenging the life cycle of human beings. Every form of life has different demands. The government cannot be responsible for your whole life from birth to death. Be it a socialist country or a capitalist one, medical services are limited. We cannot take it. Life is also limited. If patients could be saved from diseases at 150 and do not pass away until 200, society would be thrown into a mess. In 2013, a reform blueprint was approved by the third plenum session of the Communist Party of China's 18th Central Committee, which stated that the government should encourage the growth of medical institutions run by private companies or non-governmental organizations. To further safeguard the accessibility to health care, the Chinese government unveiled a package in 2014 to encourage the development of private health care. 
While putting a limit on the size of public hospitals, the measures also aim to give private organizations more leeway in charge of what they want for medical services in order to encourage competition. At the same time, public hospitals are trying out different ways to build a more positive image. In 2003, Liu Xiaocheng opened a state-owned, market-oriented cardiovascular hospital. Without any conventional administrative rankings or staffing of government-affiliated institutions, the hospital instigated a series of modern management systems, such as its contract employment policy. I am a Canadian Chinese. As far as I know, no other public hospitals could employ foreign doctors. This is what makes TICH so special. The contract employment policy works like a sword of Damocles, hanging above the heads of the doctors. Due to the contract employment policy, doctors here in TICH have taken a very proactive attitude towards their work, because any misconduct could cost them to lose their jobs. Such an advanced management system has produced some good results. My wife suffers from a blockage in the main artery and needs an immediate operation, but due to her immune thrombocytopenic purpura, We've been turned down by several tertiary hospitals in Beijing. Only TICH accepted us. The hospital that you run is a, a state-owned uh, hospital, and yet you have uh, uh, made it enormously efficient. Uh, how have you done that, and what principles can be applied to the whole sector? The administrative committee of the development area appointed myself alone. As this is a public hospital, I not only serve as the director, but also as the party secretary. In other hospitals, these two posts are held separately by two people, which easily causes disputes and conflicts. Where there are phoenix trees, phoenixes will come naturally. So where I set up stages, actors will come naturally. I am actually setting up a mechanism to liberate the production relationship. With such a liberation, there comes liberation of productivity and healthy interpersonal relations, which further give rise to advanced culture in the hospital. In my hospital, I don't need to say anything. No physician takes red envelopes. I dare say, no other public hospital directors can promise the same thing. I think this is like romance. In feudal China, marriages are arranged by parents and matchmakers. Brides and bridegrooms do not even have a chance to see each other before their wedding. The current institution with government intervention is just like that past arranged marriage. But in our hospital, I recruit people who share my values. The willing ones come. Now I have 680 staff from all over the world. Physicians from England, Australia, Hong Kong SAR, there are also retired military surgeons from the Army Navy University, Army Officer University, etc. They share the same values with me, so it is like free love. It is these spirits that attract each other in free love and holds lovers together. If there ever arises disputes, we can always break up. Such culture help us get rid of administrative levels and budgeted posts in government-affiliated organizations. And that's exactly what I want. In the reform of China's healthcare industry, how, how important is the development of the so-called non-public or private sector in reforming healthcare? The reason why China's healthcare reform is not developing fast enough is because we've missed the prime time. Politically, we have failed to let the government perform its functions. For example, to push forth a reform, what roles should the government play? Well, first, the CFDA needs to approve drugs used in medical institutions. If they keep approving cheap generic drugs, then drug companies that can even make capsules out of belts and shoe soles will flourish. Still more, in the NDRC, also referred to as the Small State Council, there is a price department that sets maximum price for drugs which give rise to 12,000 to 13,000 large medication companies and 420,000 to 430,000 
retail drug companies in China. That makes things complicated. The GlaxoSmithKline is not the only example of an individual company bribing its way to the top. They are one of the examples put under the spotlight. But the phenomena such as this again contribute to the absurdly high price for drugs. After numerous rounds of price rise, drugs finally get to the stocking racks in hospital. In the 1950s, the central government set a policy for public hospitals which required them to sell drugs at 15 percent profit. This was simply a political task that didn't make any sense. In America, patients get prescriptions from physicians and buy the drugs at pharmacies. There is no deal involved in between. But in China, things are different. Besides, the government has no subsidy for public hospitals, which kind of force them to seek ways of compensation. The director of the hospital would tell experts physicians to not only treat patients well, but also work hard for the prosperity of the hospital. But how? In order to encourage physicians' incentives, their bonus will be related to their performances. With the information gap in medical services, over-prescription is simply a natural result. In May, the scandal revolving around the death of Wei Zexi uncovered the downside of a huge Chinese profit-driven healthcare market. The 21-year-old was diagnosed with synovial sarcoma, a rare form of cancer that affects tissue around major joints. After some research online, Wei's family decided to come to the second hospital of the Beijing Armed Police Corps and spend more than 200,000 yuan on immunotherapy treatment to no avail. According to China's healthcare regulations, the treatment has not been approved for clinical use in China and can only be applied on an experimental basis. Investigation has exposed that the hospital where Wei was treated subcontracted the controversial therapy to a private medical group, which dominates most parts of China. The misleading treatment information led to the death of Wei Zexi and the revelation of the secret behind China's largest private health care investment, Putian Medical Group. The incident caused many Chinese to question the quality of China's private health care and China's ability to supervise the private health care sector. It used to be in China that there were no private health care facilities, and this is only recent. Uh, uh, and it was part of the kind of the socialist system that the state does everything. And now it's more market oriented in various other kinds of uh, systems, so there's competition in a market sense. Um, how does this affect uh, the, the uh, medical care in general when, when you have private hospitals, because private hospitals want to make a profit? You're on the inside, and so how do you judge this uh, natural tension? The very core of a medical institution's long-term existence lies in its quality and safety of Medicare. Without these two essential elements, the hospital may easily have to close down overnight. If ever some problems arise, if one patient dies an accidental death, or the physician makes a wrong judgment about the patient's conditions, I believe, even just from the legal point of view, the hospital cannot take the consequences. A problem with one patient leads to the loss of all future patients. That's why we say hospitals exist and flourish upon the basis of their medical quality and safety. I deem it an essential process for hospitals to experience this before they can focus on profitability. I would think that there would be perhaps a higher variance in uh, quality of care among the private sector because there'll be very different kinds of, uh, of investors and organizations uh, being uh, attracted to the industry. Some will be very high quality international standards or reaching for that, and some will be looking for a quick buck. Yes, I agree. The, the, the composition of the private uh, hospitals now have a di different, there's lots of variations. Some, as you said, some of them are uh, international uh, standard, which from that part of private hospital, I mean, the public hospital can learn a lot of experience, man, hospital management experience from that kind of uh, hospital. While for the other, some other part, the investors are not, uh, they don't have a medical background, so they are from other areas to have 
large investment in the health sector. So the quality of, the, of medical services are it's a big concern currently. So how do you regulate that? How do you put uh, rules in place that will create a standardized level of service in the private sector? I think the uh, regulation and supervision of private sector need, need to much strengthen. So the health authorities, of course, would play a leading role in regulating and supervising the quality of services in not only the private sector, but also the public hospitals. So we need to play a more important role in uh, reg re regulating the services. Um, but in addition to the health authorities, we, we can't depend o completely on the health authority to play the regulation role. So there are some other uh, sectors uh, which can play uh, some role in regulating the health services or improving the quality of services. For example, as we just mentioned, the uh, health insurance agency. If the payment system can include some uh, performance indicator or quality of service indicator, which will help them to improve the quality of service. And for some uh, medical treatment, the professional association can play some certain role according to international experience, they, because there are lots of top experts in the medical association, in the, some professional association, they understand the advanced, advanced technology. So this should play some role in uh, set up some regulation uh, of what kind of intervention should be introduced in the hospital, what, what kind of inter intervention should not should be excluded from the medical practice. <laughs> I was appointed as counselor to the medical reform office of the state council. Worldwide, there are currently 30 people appointed for consultation in medical reforms. Since the very beginning of changes in 2010, I've been communicating with them about those deep-rooted problems in China's healthcare development. Medical reform is actually a daunting task worldwide. We must be determined enough to launch an overhaul. As Premier Li Keqiang once said, we are resolute to carry it out, even if it is as painful as cutting off one's wrist. Otherwise, there is little chance for a successful reform. People's poor accessibility and affordability to health care is becoming even more prominent instead of easing off. If we fail to hear their demands and cater to their needs, the situation may become more than serious. In my view, medical reforms in China are a lot harder than those paying Obama. Private health care will improve all health care by introducing competition and creating a health care market. Competition for medical treatment and the patient experience. Competition for doctor's compensation and working conditions. Private health care will improve relations between patients and doctors. Because when patients have options, all services improve. That's a market economy where the customer always comes first. But for competition to work, private health care must have equal opportunity and equal access to resources, such as construction funding and insurance reimbursement. This seems to be the direction of government policy, ignoring arguments that in a socialist country only the government should provide health care. One danger of private health care is that it enables profiteers and charlatans to operate. Another is that it could widen the living standard gap between rich and poor. Health care reform continues to be one of our themes because health care reform continues to be a national priority. That's Closer to China.